Okay, uh, good afternoon, welcome. Thank you for coming to uh, the Philosophy of Chemistry seminar. Um, it is a real pleasure today introducing Brigitte van Tegelen uh, for a number of reasons. Brigitte is from Louvain-la-Neuve, so she didn't travel that far to, uh, to come for this seminar. And she is probably also the very reason uh, I ended up in history and philosophy of chemistry. <laughs> so, uh, yes, we traveled together to uh, one of the conferences in philosophy of chemistry. Right. And I got hooked and didn't leave it. So, um, also, Bridget is going to um, give a talk on a topic that is very close to my heart. Uh, because as a chemist, we consider the chemical elements a bit like our children with all their different characters. Um, I myself studied their classification at the table. And today we will have um, a much more historical talk because she is really a historian of chemistry who now leads another life in Philadelphia where she works for what used to be the Chemical Heritage Foundation but is now uh, the Science History Institute. And she will give us uh, a talk on um, the, the particular uh, history of the discovery of element 43, called it's not elementary. So Brigitte will have uh, one hour more or less for the talk, then we'll have a short break, um, five minutes, and then we have around one hour for the Q&A. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, hartelijk bedankt, Peter. <laughs> I had forgotten about this expedition, but now there are memories coming back. Also the speed limits yes. that I didn't follow on the German uh, highways. Um, yes, indeed, uh, there is not, uh, I hope uh, you will not be disappointed, there is not much uh, philosophical framework, and I do that on purpose, because um, a lot of the epistemology or philosophy on the history of elements always starts with a framework and then fits in the facts and as a historian sometimes I have uh, internal rea reactions so to speak to that uh, to that way of doing and what I want to show is that um, it's much more complicated than you usually find in a brief summary before you get to a philosophical framework or a theoretical framework that's one thing and that history itself, complexifies the thing, not just for philosophers, but in the way of telling the stories. Um, so I want to thank Peter for inviting me. I'm also uh, very grateful that you are here. I know this is a period in uh, the academic year where uh, everyone is running from examination to uh, other things. Um, and uh, I will start with a couple of remarks. So since I insist on the context of things, I will give you some context on why am I coming back to this story more than 25 years after I already met the story of element 43. Uh, I am editing a volume with my colleague Annette Lucnes. Uh, Annette Lucnes is a uh, trained as a chemist, a historian of chemistry, and she is also teaching to teachers to be, science teachers to be. Uh, so we have two different perspectives, but uh, we, we uh, try to articulate those perspectives. When we um, started for this forthcoming volume, which will be uh, out at the end of the year, uh, it was in the frame of the International Year of the Periodic Table, 2019. Um, it was a huge celebration across uh, the world, uh, so a global celebration, basically rooted in the 20, uh, no, 250th anniversary of the proposal by Mendeleev for the periodic system. And you could find all kinds of periodic uh, tables around the world. And this is one that is often used uh, in the classroom or for other purposes, which tries to 
encapsulates the idea that a discovery is done by one person in one place at one very moment. So here we don't have the dates, but we have the flags. And of course, there's all kinds of things I can tell you about this, this kind of periodic table that, that is wrong. Uh, but at that time, my colleague and I thought, okay, what can we tell about women discovering or women and elements? And by doing this work, uh, which was a historical work aimed and targeted at a general learned audience, by putting a different kind of actors into the story of the periodic system, we ended up uh, really um, expanding the history of the periodic system beyond a few bearded men uh, and a few discoverers who suddenly have, you know, a Eureka moment. And we realized that we were able to present to the general audience the complex nature of scientific endeavor and then show how the whole of the community participates in the making of an icon such as the periodic table or the periodic system. And of course, it made us think a lot about discovery. How do we tell the this, this history discoveries and what it means to the actors themselves? Because if we have stories, it's because the actors themselves are forging those histories or those, this storytelling. And uh, instead of going back to Kuhn, which is usually what is made in this presentation, um, I go back to a chemist because who, who better than a chemist can talk about what they think they are doing? And you can always think, okay, they have a very, chemists seem to have a very simple, straightforward, uh, almost non-extant uh, philosophical um, approach to what they're doing. But there is more to that first. And I think in first instance, we always need to hear the actors on what they're doing. So this is a, cite a quote from Partington, uh, 1962. Partington is a physical chemist. He's uh, um, also a historian of chemistry. Um, and he edited four volume of history of chemistry, which are very factual. This person said that at that moment, and he is able to identify, retro-identify the different uh, substance. So it's, it's a Bible, but from the storytelling point of view, it's a bit heavy. And from the epistemological point of view, it's just not the, the place to start. And to him, the meaning of discovery is well known. When a substance is prepared for the first time, so there's time, by a clearly described method, there is method, and sufficient details are given which distinguish it from other substance, it is said to be discovered. So it hangs up there in the air. And another uh, chemist, uh, Ranke Madsen, uh, Danish, uh, some 15 years later, works specifically on the discovery of elements. And he expands and, and wants to give more substance to what Partington says. So he, he starts his quote with, he has observed the existence of new substance, which is different from earlier described substance. So, from the discovery, we shift to the discoverer, who is a he in this case, uh, because most of the history of uh, science is, is, uh, <laughs> is uh, populated by male, not only because of the facts, but also because the way it's told, as we, shown, we have shown in the Women in Their Element book. And then uh, he goes on uh, on several elements on how um, uh, it can be demonstrated uh, that he is the first, because that's the, the point then becomes not when, but being the first. And the introduction of the individual in the attribution. But beyond that, you can already see there's an implicit consensus on methods and results, which is really important here. He goes on, he must have published the discovery of a new substance in such a manner that it has been noticed by contemporaries. So it cannot be a private discovery. It has to be accepted uh, and noticed by a professional group, um, which is also something very important. And there I'm coming and 
looping back to the well-known uh, well um, quote by Kuhn, who insists on the fact that discovery cannot be dated. They must inevitably, if you put a date, they are arbitrary because it's a, com a complex event. And in our words, it's a process. Interestingly, there's no mention of reproducibility uh, or the material existence of the uh, new substance in uh, Kuhn's um, well, much quoted quote. So this is one, one avenue of thought that leads us to this book. The other avenue of thought, this is from Annette Lugnes, from uh, my colleague Annette, since um, she's teaching to uh, teachers and, and science teachers in particular, the question is, why is it important beyond our little circle of historians and philosophers of science? Well, it is important because this is the type of story <coughs> that you find in textbooks, even secondary uh, school textbooks. And uh, historians uh, of science have several times uh, discussed uh, how can we bring into those textbooks and in, in, the, in the education and training of teachers, science teachers, how can we bring all what the work that is done on the philosophy and history of science side? And uh, there are two important uh, contributions in that regard by Brush, Stephen Brush in 1974 and uh, Douglas Alchin in uh, 20, uh, 2004 that really asked the question that at one point, should our discipline be rated X? Because the teachers have, cannot do anything with what we are doing. We are not formulating things in a way that they can metabolize it for their own teaching. Sometimes it, it looks like it's uh, uh, too complicated, too, too, uh, too elaborate, too sophisticated men, uh, intellectually, and they end up going back to the periodic table of flags or any other for that matter. Now, the topic of this talk, uh, element 43, um, is, um, as I said, something I worked uh, more than 25 years ago. Um, and at that time, I was interested um, by a story of two elements that were claimed to be discovered at the same time. One was uh, <coughs> regarded a couple of years later as indeed a new element. The other uh, was never confirmed and reappeared long after under another, um, uh, in another claim made in a different context. And at that time, I was interested in the intersection between chemistry and physics. And of course, since it's element 43 and 75, I will come back to that in the periodic table. As we know it, uh, we know now that 43 is a radio element, which, which means that it doesn't exist. Um, all the isotopes are, are decaying. Um, and uh, the age, uh, the, the half-life of uh, the long, longest life isotope is smaller than the age of the Earth. So all the technetium that might have been there at the beginning uh, has disappeared or disintegrated. Um, and on the contrary, 75 is a very stable, your usual chemical element. You can touch it, you can, you can uh, isolate it, you can do all kinds of things. Nevertheless, 43 uh, in the meantime has been manufactured uh, massively and is used for medical purpose, for instance. So it exists on our earth because of human uh, intervention. So uh, I will be a little bit anachronistic here, but I think it's important to reflect on what are we talking about? What is the, the substance? What is the identity of the substance we're talking about? And I will go retrospectively on purpose, which is usually not the way you do it, because whatever we're doing today, philosophers, historians, sociologists, we are doing it from our framework now and our knowledge now. Uh, 
faking the fact that we can go back to what the others, one century, two century, whatever, ago. Uh, this is a this is delusional. So it's important that we acknowledge. We think element forty three in the periodic table, in the periodic system as we know it, and then go back and compare <laughs> to what comes up before. So that's my that's my plan. So for those who are not chemists, uh, if you go to a textbook or a reference book or reference websites, technetium, TC, uh, atomic number 43, all isotopes are radioactive. Basically, we, we can observe 95 to 99. It was first synthesized in 1937 by uh, those two Italian chemists in Palermo using actually uh, a foil that had been irradiated in uh, Berkeley at the Lawrence Laboratory. And it was finally named in 1947 uh, and as Technetos artif Artificial. So yeah, then you can learn all, all kinds of other things on the isotopes and so on in those websites if you want to. Now, from the historical point of view, uh, in some of those textbooks on the reference uh, websites, you can have mention of earlier claims. The 1925 uh, claim for Mazurium and the 1908 claim for Niponium. And then people who really want to be complete on the, on the topic find all kinds of other precursors uh, and that they cite, and as you say, we, we can go back in time uh, into a time even before the periodic system, which of course is uh, uh, a question mark to me, because at that time, uh, it's not element 43, it's not even Eka manganese anymore, it's a, a new element from the group of platinum or tantalum and so on. So the, the very fact that there is a linear retrospective view on those elements is what I call biographies of elements. And um, as Peter said, this is an, uh, a behavior or a, a compulsion from chemists to consider the elements as characters that have been there since the, a, the dawn of times and that they are progressively unveiled in their uh, properties and their uh, existence and so on. So the plan of my talk today is, as I said, going retrospectively and examining not only what we can tell about what happened when Missourium was claimed, but also why this claim suddenly surfaces and what are the pieces of evidence the historians or the chemists or whoever provides to substantiate the claim for precursors or earlier uh, instances of element 43. And I give them the name they were given at that time. So in a, in a way, this is, this is a general remark. I try to use the vocabulary of the, the actors themselves. So, for instance, here, rehabilitating Missourium, this is very much the, the word that was used by those who claimed that there had been an ignored discovery of the element 43 before it was produced uh, and, and isolated in uh, Palermo in 1937. <coughs> So the whole thing starts at the Kaulöwen, <laughs> the center of the world, I suppose. <laughs> um, so there's a radio chemist, uh, Peter Vanasse, uh, who is now deceased, by the way, um, who uh, published an, um, a contribution uh, in nuclear physics, which is, I, I guess, his usual outlet, um, with a very... Uh, resounding title, The Ignore Discovery of the Element uh, Atomic Number 43. Now, this was um, a very, um, it looked like a very factual uh, claim with uh, evidence uh, that the Missourium that had been 
claimed to have dis been discovered in 1925, was indeed observed. And if it has been observed, then the uh, Van Asch claimed, we should consider going back to the name Mazurium uh, because an element cannot be discovered twice. And it is the usage, there is no written rule, by the way, of that, but it is the usage that the discoverer has the opportunity to give the name to the new element. Um, so to the, to the word rehabilitation, uh, this was not only published in a scientific journal, but there was also a sort of public campaign. And of course, there is a appetite for, from the public for ignored discoveries, ignored discoverers, people who haven't been overlooked, put aside and so on. So this is a story that sells very well. And um, it was also understood as a rehabilitation of uh, two of the three uh, authors of the initial um, uh, article, uh, Walter Nodak and Ida Tak, who later became a couple, by the way. And you see that uh, they talk about rehabilitation and also looking back to rank Matson, uh, it's also about the discoverers and not just about the discovery. So the rehabilitation is to um, rehabilitate former chemists um, who have been wronged in Peter Van uh, opinion. So what are the Eka manganese or the manganese homologue? So this is a periodic table from uh, the 19th, from 1934, actually coming from uh, uh, one of the publication of Ida Nodak, Ida Nodak Neitake. And you can see that on uh, row, no, column seven, uh, beyond manganese, there are elements 43 and 75. Of course, since she's publishing it and she believes in mazurium, you have mazurium and rhenium. And those elements until 1925 had not been isolated or recognized as uh, being discovered. So when they started this work, um, which was announced uh, at the highest level possible, the Academy of Science in Berlin, I mean, highest level for Germany, of course, uh, the, um, the news spread to the press immediately. As, as I said, there is an appetite for the history of elements also, not just about ignore discoverers. And then it was uh, published uh, by in two, in two separate uh, articles. One uh, signed Walter and Ida, uh, so Walter Nodak and Ida Tak, and the other by Otto Berg, who uh, disappears from the story. And this is, this is a sad part of the story, and I, I want to say it out loud. He was from Jewish origin. He was um, put on the team because, as you will see, they needed some specific instrumentation that was only available at Siemens and Halske, which is a uh, an industrial uh, plant, and because of his Jewish origin, he had to flee in the, the 30s. So, you know, a lot of the story of uh, Mazurium also excludes Berg. It's not only women who are excluded, I'm just insisting on the point <laughs> that many actors are missing. So uh, they thought they had the evidence clear, and uh, what is interesting is how they proceeded. So. Um, and this is to be contrasted with the way Perrier and Segre produced isotopes of 43, is that uh, they really used the periodic table as a heuristic device. They had predicted properties, uh, predicted behavior, the, what kind of oxides, what kind of hydroxides, and so on. Um, they also used the periodic table as a way to know where to look for, uh, so they were looking uh, beyond the platinum metals, which has been historically the way people try to find the uh, uh, manganese homologues. They, they looked, uh, you know, at the, at the transition group as a whole. And uh, they worked knowing that they would go for very, very low concentration, which means a lot of 
um, material to be processed, a lot of fractional distillation, a lot of uh, steps, and they are looking for um, the substance, the tangible substance. Um, the way they make the proof, uh, since it's at that time uh, one of the ways to make the proof beyond just you know <laughs> giving rhenium to everyone, um, it's uh, looking at the X-ray spectra. So they calculated it, and that's where Otto Berg comes into the picture because he had the X-ray spectrographer. Uh, later, they were able, because of their claim and their success in Germany, to, to have this kind of uh, instrument. So how does uh, Peter Van Asse, uh, back into the end of the 80s, um, provides evidence that they have seen uh, Masurio. What at that time, the X-ray spectra would look like uh, these, uh, well, they are taken on a, on a glass plate and then they are of course uh, transferred on, on paper. So this is the kind of spectra you can find. Um, the original spectra has been lost. This is also another discussion, but I'm not entering, uh, it has been broken. I'm not entering into that uh, discussion. Uh, the, in the initial contribution, it, it was a published uh, spectra, which Vanash used counting the grains and also um, reflecting on the fact that some of the ores they were using contained uranium, which can disintegrate, disintegrate uh, into technetium at one point. So his whole, whole piece of evidence is that the ores they were using could have contained technetium, even though, even for a small amount of time, that's one thing. And second, he compares what he can reconstruct from the original published spectrum with what uh, modern physics uh, delivers. Um, I will not enter here into the debate, but it is not accepted by the scientific community. We can talk about that later, but there's all kinds of things. What I want to uh, really uh, emphasize here is how Peter Van Asse and others really thought they were working with historical material. And I, I think to me that's the, the, the most um, important uh, aspect because um, there is this joint use of scientific procedure and historical material that joins uh, and um, that are, are articulated to provide the evidence. So um, when I worked on uh, Rhenium and Masurium, well, 43 and 75, um, I, I really felt uh, those were two different <laughs> children <laughs> from the same marriage, so to speak, um, that Rhenium ended up as a success. Uh, it took them uh, five years to actually produce uh, two milligrams, which is, which is a lot of work. But then it was produced industrially. Whereas Mazurium, there was little controversy at that time, I mean, in the 20s and the 30s, uh, when they were asked to, to uh, report on their latest work, they were uneasy answers. And there was no reaction on the part of the Nodak Tak when uh, there was uh, the report in 1937 that it had been produced uh, in uh, fusion products. Moreover, the archives from the Nodak Tak show that in the 50s, they were still working to isolate or extract the natural element 43 from um, the ores they were collecting. <coughs> and indeed, uh, they were continuing. This is, a, this is something in the 50s. So at the moment, at that time in the 50s, technetium is accepted on the periodic uh, system. It's, it's aspect, uh, accepted in the list of the IUPAC uh, elements. So there's no discussion whatsoever, but they are still into searching for natural masurium. 
And uh, this is where we see that there are two conflicting concepts of element. Uh, and we see the conflict, which is kind of dramatic for the for the Noda couple. So, did they still did they still name it Masurium in this in the 1950s? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, they did. Uh, I don't have here. Let me let me. No, I. I, think I it was on the note. But I, yes, I was, they did. It was gone too quickly. They so, did. They did. And uh, they even gave a talk uh, in the 50s, Vorkommen und Einreichung des natürlichen Element 43. So the existence and the um, enrichment uh, of natural. Yes, they still did. Yeah, it, it also explained the, the word rehabilitation because they were, they were considered by a, a, a huge part of the scientific community as crooks or bad faith. Uh, what, what I think this shows is that um, they, they, they were looking for the element with all its isotopes, its mich, mich, uh, the mix of isotopes, whereas uh, after the Second World War, it is really well known that producing one isotope and now just even the nucleus of a new element is sufficient evidence for having a new uh, a new substance uh, acknowledged. So now to niponium. So now we move um, <laughs> at the same time nearer to our time and backwards. In uh, 1997, uh, another radio chemist, Kenji um, Yoshihara, who's now also deceased, by the way. Uh, start working on um, element niponium, uh, who had been claimed to be discovered uh, in 1908 by a Japanese chemist, uh, Masataka Ogawa, who was then working uh, with Ramsey in uh, UCL, London, and then um, had a long standing career uh, in. Uh, in Japan. Now here we have a different case. Uh, that is that the whole um, the whole quest or the whole thought of Yoshihara is not so much that the Ogawa has discovered element forty three, but that he has discovered an element. And it turns out that this was not the element he thought he was looking for. It was uh, the higher manganese homologue rhenium. So it was not 43, it was 75. Uh, and this, uh, the case that he indeed, Ogawa indeed saw uh, 75, uh, in contrast with the case of Mazurio and Fanash, um, is substantiated both historically and scientifically by uh, this uh, group of people, um, Japanese colleagues whom I really very much admire for their work, who have gone through all the publications, but also collected uh, artifacts, uh, oral testimonies, um, and uh, even uh, found back the samples. Uh, and this is a group, uh, it's not just a scientist, it's two scientists and a museum curator, uh, historically uh, trained. So it's a really a, a nice piece of work. A bit heavy, I must say, because there's so many details and so on, but it's a, a remarkable piece of work. So in contrast with uh, Vanas, uh, the case, I think, is really made. And it also explains why element 113 has been named Nihonium, which is a, um, kind of, Nihonium is another way to say Japan in, in, uh, in Japanese, which is a way of saying that Nihonium wasn't that wrong after all, because there is this other non-written law in the naming elements that uh, you cannot use a name that has been used uh, prior and that has not been accepted as an element. 
I suppose it's not as not to raise confusion. The problem is that has been a lot of claims. So there are a lot of names that are out. So anyway, what was Matasaka Ogawa uh, doing? Uh, so he, he um, like a lot of uh, uh, Japanese uh, scientists, he comes to London to uh, and, or, or Europe, but mainly it's, it's uh, the UK to um, uh, improve his um, education. Um, Ramsey's laboratory is a place where there are a couple of <laughs> discovery of elements. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, he, he thought that in Torianit there might be a new element hidden. hidden. And uh, Ogawa uh, ends up identifying an element that he believes to be new. He only publishes in 1908, which is later when he's already back in Japanese, in Japan, Japan and he tries to continue his work, but he's of course uh, in an all other career, teaching, um, managing, um, uh, a department, uh, and also he doesn't has a, have access to the spectroscopic instruments uh, that would give the final proof or confirmation or information. Um, just there, this, this is the periodic table from the time of, well, earlier from, uh, from Ogawa. So um, you can see that there was and this is by Vendeliev, a prediction that there should be an element, an homologue from manganese uh, with an atomic weight 100. And then another one who, for which he doesn't provide any, any, uh, any uh, other prediction. Um, and just to put this in the frame of the long debate about Mendeleev being making predictions, he just mentioned the prediction of the atomic weight at one point uh, very early in defending his periodic system, but then never comes back. He doesn't provide uh, properties, uh, how will be, how the oxides, uh, which color, the, the boiling temperature, nothing of the kind for do those uh, elements. So, okay, I need to speed up. Um, okay, I'm gonna, just go on. Um, he, Ogawa himself, continues the work, and he comes to the the in a second publication. He comes to the to the conclusion that he has also found another element, uh, an atomic weight of uh, Kirka uh, 150, and could be a higher member of the manganese group. Um, I'm going to pass on this, just the thing that Nipponium was a suggestion from Ramsey, not from uh, Ogawa, because patriotism and naming of the element is another thing. <laughs> and uh, this is how um, the Japanese group uh, has uh, uh, made the, provide the evidence. Uh, first off, they observe all the steps of purification and they uh, can verify the fact that this is indeed feasible from a chemical point of view. They have used the uh, spectral lines and this is, this is not the X-ray spectra, this is uh, the um, visible spectra, which is much more complicated. And then they also have replicated the spectra with uh, some of the samples they were able to find. Yes, and this I actually already said. Now, I will go very fast on precursors. Uh, again, this is not my um, choice of words. Um, and we are going in 19, so the, the historical recollecting of precursors in the 1950s, uh, and it, it is about an episode by back in the 1877. And it starts with this publication in Nature by uh, uh, Drews and uh, Newton Friend, who uh, say that uh, there is uh, a possible precursor for rhenium, element 75, davium. And here again, uh, interestingly, uh, the, the finder or the, the, the the scientist, or it's in this case, it's an engineer who claimed 
to have discovered, let me put this here back, yes, who claimed to have discovered a new element, uh, an engineer from Russia using platinum ores from Russia, um, thought he had uh, isolated the first homologue of uh, the manganese uh, group. And he even says, uh, I think in the classification of the element proposed by Mr. Mendeleev, davium is the hypothetical element placed between the metals molybdenum and ruthenium. In that case, the equivalent of davium should be 100, because that's the, the only prediction that Mendeleev had made. But the rest of his uh, publication uh, are almost all devoted to other properties than the atomic weight. So the atomic weight was not the defining characteristic that would make this element or this substance different from all others. So he painstakingly worked uh, to uh, purify his samples. Uh, he's working with ridiculously ridiculous amount of, of uh, matter. So I, uh, we can be suspicious, but um, and he provides a spectra. This is not an X-ray spectra. We are in 1877, so this is a visible spectra. Um, and he provides other uh, properties. In their um, advocacy for, for Davium as a precursor, uh, Drews and uh, Newton Friend talk about the atomic weight, but most of it, they talk about the provenance of the ores and the different characteristic that um, Kern, Serge Kern, had provided as proof that he was uh, a good chemist or a good chemist enough to have indeed seen uh, Davium, uh, which is no longer Eka manganese, but V manganese. So I'm sorry about the messy story, but this is how it is. <laughs> so um, you can often find in websites or reference books, these kind of biographies of elements in short. So for instance, the story here would be uh, in, uh, in 1877, uh, Serge Kern, uh, claimed he had found Davium, he thought it was there. Then you have just the excerpt on the Mendeleev table, nothing more. He didn't publish anything. It was not acknowledged. And then you move on to the next, Neponium and so on. So everything would be fine if we would not continue to read publication on those stories. And this is where, um, with my colleague Annette, we believe that uh, not only uh, you need to historicize the concept of element, not only, uh, and this is, I think, uh, acknowledged by everyone, discovery is a social process. It's a process and it's a social process. We can't put a definite date, but there is also the context of narration. And the context of narration actually starts at the very moment of the publication, but it's, it doesn't end there because you can always come back in time and you can apparently, I mean, this is what the stories of uh, the many lives of element 43 shows. You can always um, look back at what chemists or other scientists have done and reinterpret it in a new frame, which is not only the frame of, in the case of Serge Kern, 1877, but also the frame of the 1950s or the frame of uh, the 90, uh, end of the 1980s for Masurium and so on. And that means that whenever a story is told, um, the context, the, the very story, uh, the, the stories of discovery are a contextualized process as well. Now, how does this um, produce a book and we hope a useful book. Um, so in this book for a general uh, audience and especially for science teachers, uh, we have aimed at providing fresh perspectives on discovery of what we thought was the most elemental thing you could uh, work on, chemi chemical elements, and also a reflection on how <coughs> these discoveries came about. 
And uh, this is very much in the, in the perspective of uh, what Simon Schaffer uh, published in 94, saying that the very, the very process of discovery uh, emerge in the make making of the disciplinary stories of each scientific practice. And so it's not only linked to the scientific practice, but how the practitioners view themselves and, and, uh, and uh, perform themselves on the, on the public stage. And so we, we add the layer of the context of narration saying that the historians also are performing in a way and there are uh, not necessarily hidden agenda, it's just, uh, it's just uh, <laughs> the impact of being somewhere in time at uh, the, the time of writing those stories. Now, I'm trying to be short. Um, our, our book will provide those fresh perspectives uh, based on nine cases. So here is one case that you heard. Uh, each author has a different perspective on, on the narration. For instance, we have Sarah Hyman's uh, who worked on uh, aluminum and she very much shows that the story of the discovery of aluminum, aluminum was a moment where the scientific community and specifically the French scientific uh, chemical community was trying to find um, a coherence and, and uh, be able to start uh, the story with a shared understanding of where it started. And to make sure this is a useful book, uh, we add teaching suggestion for all chapters uh, with the hope that this can be brought into the classroom. So not only feeding the, the, the education uh, and training of teachers, but also uh, being used in uh, the classroom. So thank you very much. Sorry, I was late. I was uh, supervising an exam. Yeah, that's I. I know. I know. <laughs>
pense que j'ai assez montré. Ok. The floor is open for questions. And I don't have any questions at the moment on YouTube, so yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you can do that. I'm just out of curiosity. So you say there's no rules about this naming. Um, how would names be changed? Are there rules about that? I'm just asking because I work on taxonomy and there, there's extensive rules about naming. And I know that like you have about the Anthropocene and Barracuda and so on. There's like there's a range of procedures scientists have used to make these arbitrary calls about naming and classification and some folks, some have committees and I was just wondering how it works in chemistry if if everyone agreed to all issues. Is there a procedure? Is it just usage? So, you, so you, your question is um, is double. Do I understand well that how how is the procedure of naming, and is there a procedure for renaming, or? Um, yeah. So in general, rules about naming and renaming procedures. Yeah, yeah. So at um, IUPAC, uh, which is the International Union for Pure and Applied Chemistry that was founded in 1919. Uh, it's, it's the international body uh, that actually uh, oversees nomenclature, nomenclature um, terminology, units, symbols, and so on. And uh, elements is just one particular case of the, the whole thing. So the general procedure for the, everything is that there is there are commissions um, or groups and so on, and it works on the basis of consensus uh, inside a commission or a committee uh, that has been appointed democratically. I I wouldn't say, but you know e each each member country can delegate someone uh, there are some people who are titular members but it's it's quite consensual so that's that's a thing um and there is no there's no way of making a rule and enforcing it i mean if if you want to you can still edit the periodic system with Missourium. <laughs> nobody's gonna sue you or and, and the same works for organic uh, nomenclature and so on. But it's, it's the general view that it is to the chemist's advantage to have the same language, okay? <coughs> so that's, that's the general thing. Now, when it comes to elements, um, there is the practice and there is uh, how, how the so the practice of naming elements, as I did in the past, before IUPAC, and then uh, what has uh, evolved from it in the frame of IUPAC. What usually happened is when someone claimed to have found an element and was convinced he or she uh, would have provided sufficient evidence, uh, he or she would propose a name. And the acceptance was then dependent on whether the new substance is acknowledged as a new substance and is acknowledged as doing what it is supposed to do. That was in the past. So, for instance, when Marie Curie uh, publishes in 1898 uh, with Pierre Curie and Gustave Bémont, we, we, think, we, we believe we have found two new elements this way that are more radioactive than uranium, and we propose the two names, polonium and radium. That's how it works. Because it's it's a way of for them to, uh, and for other chemists, to identify this, <coughs> this substance. Now, after IUPAC comes in, there was supposed to be a commission uh, that would verify uh, the, the fact that there is a new element to put in a list provide all the properties and especially the atomic weight, which is refined years after years. Um, and inside that commission, it incorporated this usage of the founder or the discoverer proposing a name. 
until there was a clash uh, between conflicting claims on uh, transfermium elements, which were only produced in two places in the world, uh, Soviet Union and, and uh, USA. And of course, naming and having the name accepted was a question of priority and, and controversy. So at that time, you can have different names. And that it was then decided that the final say on who gets, uh, who decides on the name was done in this um, uh, Commission for Atomic Weight and Isotopic Abundance. But they do that through what I would say is a democratic and consensual process. There are a couple of rules, like you can't use a name that has already been used. Uh, um, um, it should not be too nationalistic. I mean, there's kind of unwritten things. And they receive for a period of time all the suggestion, and then they make a case, and this is it. So it's usually it follows what the discoverers are suggesting. But for instance, for Nihonium, there was no suggestion. It was element 113. And this is also why actually when I tell the story of element 43, I'm, I very much have this kind of framework that we know that element 43 has to exist. Uh, we know that element 113 has been observed and it is called element 113. And the name that will come to it after is, is a question of, of consensus. <coughs> but but there is no question about the element 130. Yeah, and there was also, I mean, I will not go into details, but at one point they, it was, they invented a new nomenclature with, that would just give the number in, into, uh, into another form and you need, uh, but, yeah. The, uh, does that answer? And yes. There, yes, and uh, as, as far as I know about renaming, it has never happened. Um, and it would really need a lot of evidence to go back. Uh, the chemists are, they are embedded in practice and usage. And they are not so much always worried about the ultimate truth. They prefer to be able to communicate than to have the last word. So it's and it would it would be a huge change for the whole community. So as far as I know, that has not not happened except for the, the period of the transferium where you had uh, some kinds of other names that were. Uh, and in our book, actually, there is one contribution on nobelium, which was named a little bit quickly after the first claim that it had been observed in Stockholm for a change which was not, I mean, that claim uh, appeared not to be reproducible. So the name should have been scratched away, but since it had been announced, it has been kept that way. So it's, it's very, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know how to say that. The chemists are just going with the practice and the usage. But so then everything is in the hands of the chemist, not the physicist. I will not comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> My husband is a physicist, but he works on molecules, so some of his colleagues think he's uh, just a chemist. <laughs> uh, but you mean about the elements? Yes. Um, yeah, well, then I can continue the story because uh, what happened with uh, with the element, so after Second World War, it's very clear that all the elements are going to be produced by physical means. Um, and uh, the, the naming process uh, is a joint work between IUPAC and IUPAP, so International Union for the Phys pure and applied physics. Um, and yeah, so phys physicists have a word if that's the question. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the, uh, the role of history of discoveries because I'm quite sympath sympathetic with the Sheffer. Uh, so this, there's a history of discovery that is really important for scientists. 
So in the constitution of their community, and it's why, for example, I was a physicist in France, so there's still a bunch of physicists that still do not believe that Einstein discovered relativity in France, and they do, con they do conference every year, and so, because it's part of who you are as a group of physicists. And there's the history of discovery from the historians, like much more complicated, less focused on individuals, history of instrumentation, history of community, history of institution. And they don't, obviously, historian of science don't serve the same role. But so they could evolve completely separately, and who cares? Except when you do textbooks. So what what kind what is the role of history of science in the training of scientists and in in the general public to to to, to explain to you, to them uh, what is science? Because I would be, you know, what the historians are, are, are describing is the real stuff. It's a mess. It's complicated. There's a lot of factors. But it's not how you train scientists, usually. So I, I'm puzzled about that. Yeah, and uh, I think there's one more reason to be puzzled about that, is that when scientists um, are doing that work of... Uh, commemoration, recollection, and so on, uh, they believe they do history of science. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we, we, we really, I mean, this, this is a, a central question, and especially uh, in, in our book, I mean, in thinking about our book, um, this is a question that is not easy to address. Um, how can I get into the, it's, it's not easy to address because as you say, scientists are not trained to be, to take the time. It's, I don't think they are unable to, but they are not trained and equipped to be reflective about their own practice. And often when historians and philosophers come to them, they are not respectful of their practice, of the scientists' practice. So, I mean, there's no dialogue there, and there needs to be a dialogue. Um, and it needs to be also an acknowledgement of what are the needs that are met by those practices. And here I'm, I'm talking now about the historical practice. It, the historical practice of scientists is really um, at the core of their identity more than they believe. Uh, it's a social, I mean, it's it's really finding their identity. And you say, okay, it's but you say that uh, uh, the, uh, Einstein has not discovered relativity. Uh, I mean, the, 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 they are giving talks and so on. Uh, but it's important that this kind of thing can s still go on and that people can respond. And then, so in the same way, uh, when you, there are all those endless controversies, it's sometimes a bit annoying or embarrassing because sometimes there are ad hoc, uh, or ad hominem arguments, but, but people are so, um, uh, involved in it that it must have a meaning. And uh, in the case of, to go back to the case I examine, uh, my main question when I was looking at the documents, for instance, from Van Asch and so on, is why, why does it matter to them? And I think this is, this is the way we can start the dialogue. You know, this matters to you. Why does it matter to you? And then, you know, go and, and boil it down and the understanding that when they are commemorating, they are selecting trunks, chunks of history. They are building a myth, even though they don't believe it. When, when the system of acknowledgement, which you know, they always end their talk saying, and this is a teamwork, and I want to thank this and that. But in the end, who gets the Nobel Prize? If, the, if, if he or she gets a Nobel Prize, it's one person. So the, the retribution system of, of science is still very much in, in those terms. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's a dialogue that can be fruitful there, thinking about other ways of acknowledgement 
especially in times of crisis of recruitment in science, because you cannot always uh, tell those stories of discoverers and so on. People are not always going to do a new impressive discovery that has been that will be talked about for centuries, but they will nevertheless be contributing to science. Mm -hmm. So those roles should be uh, put forward to, and that's what we, we did with the women in their element. We found out that if you really want to talk about the periodic system, it's not just about having a system, it's not just having about the element. The elements continue to be discovered in their properties, in their toxicity, and there's discussion, and, and all the work around those elements is part of science, as much as Mendeleev and his beard finding the periodic system. I mean, I, I, I very much admire what he did, but he was not the only one. And he was working with all these things that had been gathered by others. And I think that's, to me, that's where we are aiming at. Um, I'm not sure, this, this is gonna take a long time. Um, and I'm not sure that uh, there is another way that I can see to bridge the gap as of now. But, but when you say that we should include more uh, social history of science in, in the training of scientists, because here the scientists have almost no history. To my philosophy? Knowledge, but they have philosophy of science. So mm -hmm. we could, we could if, we, if they agree, we could, and we usually don't because we try to find a way to communicate with them I and mean, to, to be interesting. But uh, but on the other hand, you're, you're right. Science is an enterprise of many people's institution, system, instrumentation, and maybe we should have the, more, yeah. more social history of science in, in the training of scientists. Yeah, but what for? I mean, the question is always to answer a need. Yeah. And um, and also the, the science, science I mean, maybe I'm mistaken because uh, it's a long time since I've studied science, but um, science itself is also taught very uh, theoretically. And there is no, there's no much attention on, on the practice. And I, I believe that the point where historians and scientists could talk together fruitfully is practice. So, how do you write this? Why do you do that? And so on. I mean, it's really so. Yeah, I'm not sure coming with a new. Yeah. Uh, the problem of social history of science is that it is often seen as a. As a demystifying and unveiling science faith. So I'm not sure that's the way. You, saw, you see what I mean? Yeah, no. Uh, this goes way how, beyond. I see how my scientist colleague would say, oh, la, la, la. if you explain how arbitrary certain decisions are taken, you will destroy the prestige and the reach of science. But, but, and it's not the time is, to do that. No, no. It, so that's, there's the time constraint, and then there is the, 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 the question of arbitrariness. So the time constraint. Uh, yeah, there's nothing I can say about that. But the arbitrariness, I think this is really the core of the discussion and could be the core of the discussion. Because in a lab, and uh, André can testify to that, in a lab, and, and Peter, because you worked in a lab, in a lab, it is messy. Mm -hmm. Everyday practice is messy. So, so there is a way in which the scientists are trying to... to make something meaningful emerge from this messiness, they just don't reflect on it. Yeah, okay. Good point. So, yeah, yeah. and that's in why... The writing of the paper and the messiness disappeared. Yes, and, and the problem is that a lot of people think, okay, the publication stands for the, for the final mm -hmm. and, and the truth, but you don't see all the, all the layers. And in the stories of Element 43, which I, I, I find fascinating, is that people who are radio chemists or 20th century chemists look back in the past and are still able to assess the validity of analytical procedures from the 19th century. And that is what they base on, they base their, their judgment on to, uh, 
to reassign or to rehabilitate or to uh, find precursors. So somehow the history is always there with them, but they don't know, they don't realize, they don't, they don't reflect on it. Yeah. <clears throat> um, you, you said at some point that a, a same element cannot be discovered twice, but I was wondering if you were claiming that or if you were attributing this claim to others, or, and anyhow, what does it mean precisely that it's not possible to discover twice the same, the same element? Yeah, I, that's, I don't remember when I said that. Can you say the context? Because it, it doesn't... Uh, it was in the introduction, I think. The yeah, I think then I was referring to the naming procedure uh, your colleague asked about, because it, it actually elements can be discovered. Yeah. Um, and to I mean then again it's the context. I mean, if it, for instance, um, but some elements were discovered uh, in several places of the world, not at the same time, but you know, at the time when the others didn't know about it. For instance, um, in the case of astatine, astatine is uh, the lower, um, well, it's not the lowest because now there's organism. Um, uh, astatine is, is in the halogen uh, group. It's radio, it's a radio element. Um, and it was first, uh, discovered uh, in, in the end of the 30s. Uh, but in 43, there was a group of uh, women in Wien, in Vienna, who were able to identify isotopes of astatine who were stable, that were stable, you know, with the good old method, so to speak. So they kind of rediscovered astatine. But the attribution for the first is, so maybe that's what I meant, I'm not sure. But yeah, I mean, in a way, when when someone works on on uh, on an element in his or her own laboratory, he is re rediscovering things for himself. But the 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 general history will only pick up one person or what not one person, but one moment, uh, and attribute it to that moment in the community. So. Um definition of the concept of discovery includes that it's the first time and it's that that we will call discovery not because the discovery is when it is recognized by the, by the whole community and it's known once and for all no. No. just so, because it's the first we call that discovery so the the yeah i see i see i see what you mean now um so it is a problem to define discovery, uh, let's say for an element, is it when it was first thought of? For instance, with um, Davium at one point, there was a controversy between Kern and another guy whose name, Hall, I think uh, in English, said, well, you know, there's nothing new here. M uh, Mendeleev had predicted the element. So is it when it's predicted, when it's when uh, um, isolated in combination or not, if it's when it's produced, when it's named, and so on. So this is this is for sure accepted to be a process. But what happens when scientists try to make sense of the history of the discovery of elements? They will aim at the first, and then of course that's when the controversies are endless. Uh, there are first that are without any question, like Marie Curie, but there are other first, it's, it's complicated. And in the case of uh, element 43, the general underpinning here in the mind of scientists who write these textbooks and so on is that element 43 has always been there and it has been discovered several times in different ways. And then there's the endless discussion was it him? Was it him? And so on. So the, the yeah, I see what you mean. I need to, I need to, uh, yeah. Okay. 
Well, I have another question. So, so the story was in three acts, and you show three different points in time in which the element 43 or 75 were discovered, but then also always going a few years into the future, and there's a chemistry historian who rediscovers this work and says, well, we should rehabilitate it more. He's the real discoverer, um, which means that clearly those uh, were not being generally accepted by the chemical community. And, and you didn't really go in much detail as to why Tavion or Deponium or even Mazurium had not been accepted by the chemical community, even though they they published it, they communicated about it, they tried to make a good case for it. So can you maybe just... Yes, sure, this? sure, yeah, yeah. So um, for Davium, um, Kern published in 1877, by the way, it was first at the Académie des Sciences in French, and then the, the rest was very much published in um, Chemical News, a journal uh, founded by Crookes, who, was a, uh, who liked a lot the discovery of new elements. Um, and uh, there was a slight controversy, and at one point uh, there were uh, no more publication from Cairn, no more claims, so it kind of went, you know, into silence. Nobody was able, nobody published, say, oh, I was able to reproduce his results, he's right or he's wrong. Uh, there were only criticisms about... Um, his um, ability or expertise as a good analytical chemist on other things, implying that in this case we should not, uh, we should trust not, him. yeah, we should not uh, trust him either. Uh, so that's one. That's Davium. Um, Niponium. The case is is quite clear um, that uh, he was uh, Ogawa did not publish anything anymore. Nobody published anything on the topic infirming and confirming. So it just also died like that. Uh, there were talks, and, and uh, this is a, a bit painful. People said, oh, because he realized he was wrong. And then, you know, in Japan, you cannot criticize. And I think this is not the case. The, the, the work my colleagues have done shows very much that he was trying to work on it, but didn't have the instrument at hand. And actually, on his dying bed, he received, um, they had, when he was dying, they had uh, made the spectrum and could make the case convincingly that it, he didn't see eka manganese, but vi manganese. So he saw something, and he was a, a discoverer in the sense of uh, private discoverer, not public. Uh, but they, so that's how it ended. Mazurian. Did they it to him? No, they didn't. They didn't. Okay. Not that I, not that I remember. They didn't. I don't think they did. I have to verify. It would be a nice story, yes. but yeah, <laughs> 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 poignant, poignant, yes. yeah. Um, and then um, Mazurian. So they, uh, they, there was a lot of controversy. So this is a larger context. I have to, I'm sorry, I have to expand. So Walter Nodak and Ida uh, Nodak-Tak are classical chemists. Um, well, he's a physical chemist, uh, but very well trained in analytical procedures. And she is uh, a chemical engineer. She has been trained as an organic chemist, uh, mainly. Um, they... Um, they were already apart from a community that was emerging, which is a radiochemistry community. And Ida Nodak is the person who uh, made the suggestion of fission, nuclear fission, in 1934. She did that because Fermi, Enrico Fermi, who, by the way, got the Nobel Prize for this, but. <laughs> It's wrong. Uh, claimed to have produced uh, transuranium, 93, 90, no, 93, 94, yeah. 
Um, and uh, uh, she was able, because she knew the literature on, on, uh, on, on uh, elements and, and the expected property, that she, was, she was pretty sure that they, they didn't observe 93 and 94, but that the only question that they didn't solve in that publication, Fermi et al., was the fact that um, they had not looked for uh, smaller pieces and she, so she just suggested, well, what if the nucleus could just split, break apart, and then in your experiment, you would see all these things, which are not 93, 94, but just smaller pieces, I mean, lighter elements. So she made that suggestion in 34, and it's only in 38 oh. that um, the, the nuclear fission was officially <laughs> discovered. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and at the time, uh, her suggestion coming from someone who had not been able to confirm or substantiate the claim for a new element, Missourium, was not taken clearly as uh, seriously. And furthermore, her suggestion didn't match with the, the, the worldview of the radiochemist at that time. So all this to explain that um, there were suspicions, there were um, also, how can I say, um, tensions, um, and that someone like uh, Segre, for instance, writes that he wanted, he asked Walter Nodak in person to see the plate, which Walter uh, Nodak claimed it had been broken in a move, um, and all that, you know, there's all these rumors and things so because this is very much social and anecdotal story. But anyway, so they were kind of put aside because they had not been able to, to confirm. But on their end, and I think this is where Van Asch is wrong, trying to rehabilitate Missourium, let's say that they F actually saw it. They were not able to repeat it the way they wanted to produce it. So if you would go back in time and say, okay, now we, we call it technetium mazurium, it would not match the actor's perspective because Walter and Ida Nodak were after natural 43, not something in a, in a thing. In a, so again, it was not substantiated. They did not, um, they did not publish on it anymore. Mm -hmm. Nobody else publishes on it because it's, it's not reproducible and that's how it dies. So that's the end of the three stories. It's just, it dies. Sometimes uh, people retract their claims, but in, the, in this case, uh, there is no retraction. None of them. And then if you go to the, the claims by Vanasha, it is not recognized. Some people have tried to, to work on the spectrum and other um, uh, specimens. It didn't, it, it's not acknowledged. Um, Ogawa, you see it has been reassigned, which I think is really interesting because again, it doesn't follow the actor's perspective because Ogawa really thought he had seen a Kamanganese. Of course, then he says, I have seen another element, heavier, okay, but he doesn't pursue it publicly any further. And in case of Kern, he just drops it. But the fact that uh, Drews um, and so on are looking for precursor, again, sorry to go into all those details, but Drews and Loring were other people, were uh, you, you, British chemist who claimed to have seen rhenium a little bit after 1925 when uh, Nodak uh, et al. came out with that. So they were competing also. So this is another strategy. If you don't want your colleague to be first, you find a precursor. <laughs> no one gets it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's a very interesting strategy. I mean, Lavoisier used it. Uh, he, he used that strategy to, um, to think about, you know, the, the weight, uh, the, um, when you burn something, the weight augments instead of, of uh, going lighter for metals, because the problem, it's not the same for everything, unless you just close the system. 
And instead of uh, referring to um, an apothecary from the 18th century, uh, Pierre Bale, he refers to Ré back in the 17th century. So he doesn't have to mention someone else. That's a, that's a yeah, I think it's, it's almost a rhetorical technique, isn't it? But, but it points again at the fact that being first is, is, a, is a historical product. Yeah. Uh, just a follow-up with the ancient introduction. When the element is first isolated in 37, do they mention the earlier work? Or they do. Uh, saying it has been claimed and then that it's over. Um, and the interesting thing about practice and analytical procedure is that um, they, they not only produce the isotope, but they make sure that the, the new produced uh, manufacturer substance has the properties expected. So not just the atomic number, but the properties expected. So even though they are radio uh, chemists or nuclear scientists, they very much follow the, the procedures from their uh, predecessors. Yeah. But often in those publications, they mention the failed attempts or the, you know, yeah, that's, uh, and that's where scientists are actually doing history and that's where they should be equipped. Yeah, I have one big metaphysical question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because I feel it's like an elephant in the room and I have to ask it. Do you think it's a real same element that has been discovered several times or just different ways of inventing something that resembles what has been invented earlier? Like, are you metaphysically realist about chemical elements? Huh. I, I, I'm not sure I'm going to answer your question. I'm going to answer about the fact that you cannot be a historical realist. That's what I want to say with this work. That is that if we don't acknowledge the fact that the actors are constructing their object and then sharing it with the community, one way or another, publishing, or sharing the samples and so on, then we miss the point about telling their stories. You see what I mean? So I'm not, in, I'm not so much, maybe I lack any philosophical sensitivity or I, I'm not so much interested about the answer of the question, does this element exist forever? And uh, we just, we're just blind. And when we, we, when we play hide and seek with elements and then suddenly someone finds it and, uh, and then everyone can see it. I'm more interested in the way that in this procedure, uh, in this process, sorry, um, the actors come in with their own limitation. For instance, the Nodak cannot think of an element that, can, that is not naturally present on the Earth's crust. And I think this is the important, to me, this is the important element of the story that makes the whole sense of it. And at the same time, this is also this, this, you know, this naivety they have is exactly what serves Ida Nodak in making a proposal that everyone in the radio <coughs> chemical community finds completely stupid. And so that's what I'm interested in. And I'm, I'm sorry I cannot answer the other question. No, I think you answered. Yeah. <laughs> But it's, it's Peter that will disagree, but... <laughs> sure! <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but as a finger on that, because I, I'm, I'm a bit confused by, by the Nodak, about their position as to what actually happens. It, it, it seems to me from what you said that when then in the end, when was it, 37? Yeah. It's been discovered. They 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 didn't immediately jump on them and said, "Oh, no, this is no, wrong no. because we discovered it long no, no, before." No, no, no. And they did so. But but correct me if I if I understood it wrongly. That they did so because they thought, "Oh, well, this is something artificially produced. 
who are after natural thing. But the, so they're working with two completely different notions of a chemical element. You can have an artificial element and you can have a natural element. So there's an artificial 43 and a natural 43. But I think, well, because a, I mean, I, I don't care whether it's made artificially. No, 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 found it no, you don't It's an interesting care. question. It doesn't yeah, exist yeah, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and they may have said, like, we're convinced it must be present, just completely naturally. So we must also be able to find it naturally. We don't have to produce it artificially. But it doesn't change the, the fact that someone made it. And, 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 and so you should get a priority. Who should get the priority? The, 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 in, in 37. Yes, but if in the 50s they were, let's say, I mean, this is, of course, hypothetical. Let's yeah. say in the 50s they, they eventually are able to they produce find. natural masurium. Yeah. Then they can go back to 25 and say we were the first. Okay, so they were, it's because they were unsure about their own discovery 25. Yes, and, but they were unsure, but at the same time they were still uh, believing uh, that they had seen something. Okay. Okay. But not believing it enough to, at that point, jump on it and, 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 and start a discussion. But what discussion would there be? Well, when in 37 someone yeah. announces that they discovered the element, I would have expected them to react and, 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 and say, well, no, because we published these things in 25. But they were not able to substantiate their claim okay. after. So I think strategically, the, the being silenced was the best thing okay. to do. I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't see what they could have done. I mean, the 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 science was correct in thirty seven. The expected properties were found. It, she, there was no way to make a comment saying, "No, you didn't see thirty three because thirty three should act this way and not that way." So they, there was nothing to say. Okay. I mean, one of the things that the, the rest of the community expected them to say is, "Say, oh yeah, we were wrong," but they didn't say that because they didn't think they were wrong or they didn't want to say they were wrong. But since they were continuing after the 50s to work on that, of course, that's private matter. That's not public, but it's private. I, it is my understanding that they really believe we're going to eventually be able to do it. And I'm, I'm putting in parallel something else that a lot of the history, uh, well, not a lot of history, but there are several instances in the history of chemistry or even physics, material sciences, let's say, where something is produced in the lab and then suddenly it exists outside. So one, one huge example of that is the nuclear reactor and then the Oklo phenomena. Mm -hmm. And there is, there is a, this, this inner drive of finding the counterpart of artificial into the natural world. So I, that's my understanding of why they were just continuing to think this this is possible but just if i have something about this artificiality the natural that's specific to physics and chemistry because if you discover something in the lab in physics people will not say it's not physics if you discover a weird behavior or one of the good examples is co-evolution between bacteria mm -hmm. in a lab you would always ask yourself is it real biology? Is it how life is outside? Mm -hmm. So this discovery of co-evolution that was very important, but seen only in the lab, mm -hmm. when it was discovered in the in the pound, in the level of the pound, and they could see the evolution, so, ah, it is a natural phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So in physics, it's really weird. In physics, it's chemistry. The, the, the sample is artificial, the machine is artificial, the measure is artificial. Still natural, you know. It's still natural behavior, but in other fields, they would say, "Oh, yeah." And it's, I'm it's not about sure. I'm yeah, not and sure. it's also about the context, being able to yeah. And so, for instance, another uh, they because we know what they were reading. I mean, part of it. Um, in I think it's I don't remember in the fifties, uh, technetium ray um, lines were observed in the sun and so on. So they were keeping up with that literature. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean, when you, when you start thinking about the, the term discovery, to me, at least intuitively, it would feel a bit like it should be there in order to be discovered. Because I'm going to produce it, it doesn't sound like a discovery. Like, oh, where are my cakes? And then after half an hour, oh, look, 
I just produced a gate. I discovered a gate. It sounds like a strange thing to say, isn't it? So maybe that's why. They, but what what do you say about the the isotopes produced in in thirty seven? Yeah. So so maybe maybe calling it. Oh look, we discovered it. I can see how that may feel different from from actually finding it naturally in, in some ore through chemical means because they they, they work towards it. They produced it. It wasn't there before. I wonder. I wonder to what extent that play this distinction because this this is exactly the natural artificial one. Yeah, maybe. But Peter, there's always a switch in science between tools and objects. You know, sometimes you discover the electron. After that, you use the electron to do a TV, and you don't care about how it works. And there's always this weird movement between object as a tool, object as a as an object, and that may instruments are very complicated because you always ask yourself okay is when, when, where is the real stuff in that but mm -hmm. but that that's the if you follow the practice is what you see all the time yeah and i i would add the the if you go again to the chemical practice you know when when you work on those ores you are manufacturing the element actually yes so and, and and most of the, the chemical work is is um, understanding by making. Yes. The thing is that uh, the the tool the nuclear tools were not deemed by the NODAC to be the tools to get to the full yeah. element. Yeah. I mean, the, it, it has been a long discussion, for instance, the last definition of, of you know that, uh, of, of uh, element. So an element, you, you only have to produce a nuclear and not, I mean, maybe five or 17 nuclear in a, in a and then it, it, it is deemed to exist. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but that means, you know, that's where I'm, I'm metaphysically not, not interested in whether it exists or not. I'm interested in how do the actors construct their object. Yeah, but as a metaphysical realist, I am interested. In, so I would say, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would say, I okay, want to no, know. No, I know everything about Peter. <laughs> I want to know if techniques here is here in this world. And it's an interesting question. Where am I forced to make it myself? And, and and that is where I can see a but difference you, in, 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 in what you in what a chemist would see as a discovery. And sure, it's not there in its elemental form, it's an oxide or whatever, but at least in the Yeah, but I can there, grant yeah, uh, the you, nucleus yeah. is there. And so is the is the nucleus there? And and not still well, they must be here. And and others would say, no, it's it's too unstable, so we will have to produce it whenever we want it. We we'll have to produce it. Yeah. But you see how five or seven is not a big statistic. No, well, and then they're even they're even getting more difficult because it has to also exist for a sufficiently yeah. long time. Yeah, 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 stable, yeah, yeah. To to at least be surrounded by the electron shells, even if it wouldn't happen, because without okay. electrons there is no chemistry. Okay. Yeah, but and now Eugen said, well, we should change that because not only should it be not only should it exist long enough to be surrounded by electrons, it should be long enough to create at least one chemical bond with something yeah. else, because if we're not going to make any chemical bonds, then we're not doing chemistry. So yeah, it gets tricky. Yeah, but the interesting thing is that the the the, the concept of element is different in time. Yeah. And it is constructed. But don't worry, one day a planet was not a planet. So, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe there will be a meeting. <laughs> it was, oh, I know these. No. Yeah. Other questions? I have a last question. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, well, after is. metaphysics, I'm sure it's <laughs> ontology. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> it's always the it's oh. <laughs> Yes. It's a big question to know whether it is legitimate or not to predict that something, some chemical element or physical particle exists just on the basis that there is an empty spot in the representation. There's a very good yeah. book about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I, I know that we will talk about similar topics. Um, so, well, for, first question, what do you think of this question? Is it legitimate or not? 
Yeah, so what is legitimate? Just, just to predict that, that something exists just based on, well, it's the heuristic use of the periodic table, basically. Yeah. Um, and second question, uh, from an historical point of view, uh, the, the scientists that you talked about, uh, did they uh, reflect on that question, have this sort of epistemological worries or, or questions? Yeah, um, I can start uh, answer the the, con the concern. I mean, the the worries or the or the what we know about the epistemological position. Um, of course, I don't know about Ogawa or Kern. I mean, mm -hmm. certainly not. Um, and the, for Ogawa, the question should be asked to to my my Japanese colleagues. You know, if if we have textbooks or manuals or whatever he wrote and how he thought about it. But for the Nodak, uh, the Nodak Tak uh, couple, we do have in 1934, on the occasion of the... Uh, of yes, um, she, she wrote uh, uh, an article on the periodic uh, system and its holes. The Lucke, um, or its gaps, more. Um, and um, it's really interesting that um, she so she reviews, you know, all the claims, not theirs, not very much. I mean, she just passes on it like it's it's done. But she reviews 61, 85, 87. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think that's about it. Uh, those were all the elements before uranium that had not yet been discovered. No, 81, 84, 87, yes, okay, and 61, so quatre. And um, uh, so she reviews the, 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 the literature on that, and then she goes on, uh, which shows that she understood what was going on in radiochemistry, that, okay, if, if we have isotopes, then... Uh, maybe we should think of another periodic table. Um, so that means that she, my interpretation, and it comes into the thing that they are really struggling with what is natural, what is artificial, are isotopes, you know, real beings, chemical species or not? So she had that reflection. Interestingly, there's a, at the same time an article by Lise Meitner, who takes, of course, a completely different view, uh, but which is really also very interesting. Now, um, prediction and heuristic use. So, um, I'm sure prediction has a highly metaphysical <laughs> echo resonance in philosophy which I don't master, um, and my, my knowledge about it is really, in this case, you know, how Mendeleev predicted or not new elements. Um, I think this has to be heavily revised. Uh, in our book, actually, one of our colleagues is working on the discovery of uh, germanium, germanium, which was at first assigned to the wrong place by Mendeleev itself himself. So it's really interesting. And the one who was able to really put it in the right place was Lothar Mayer, a contender of Mendeleev. And I think this is really interesting about what the horizon of possibilities is. So I will take uh, the, the metaphor of discovering uh, the great discoveries. You know, you set sail, you think the earth is round, you set sail, you go, you reach something, and it has to be far east. Of course, it's not. I mean, of course, we know it's not. Uh, but when you set sail, you're looking for something. And, and the way, the, the fact that you're looking for something, you construct it. So in the case of prediction, you know, it's not about being right or wrong, it's just the way it works. In the case, for, for instance, of um, Ogawa, and even before, 
there is this feeling among chemists on the whole of the 19th century, and uh, Sarah Heimans has wrote, written about that with the tantalum metals, there is a feeling that there are several elements inside the platinum ores or, or columbite and other mineral ores that are still to be discovered. And it's not substantiated before Mendeleev. It's not substantiated by uh, having a periodic system, but it's just a growing feeling. You know, they know oh, we have, we, with the refinement of analytical procedure, we're going to find something. And, and this is the motivation for setting sail. You see what I mean? So, and I'm not answering on a metaphysical, you know, the value and so on. I'm just saying that the actors are motivated by these predictions, these feelings, these uh, shared understanding that there is something out there and it should be in the platinum ores. So everyone who can put a hand on a platinum ore is going to try to do very refined analytical procedure. And at the same time, the other chemists are working just on analytical procedures and they're building their the, the, the tools, as you said, that they are going to, the, the first one are going to use. But, but again, if we don't take that into account, these motivation to set sail, then we, we're not telling the stories in a fair way. And, and, and we are not, I think this is what I take from all these stories and biographies of element is that actually the chemists who tell our stories believe element 43 exists from the dawn of time until the end of time. And that it's just a matter of scientists to look right at the right place, at, you know. But, but how the scientists got there it's, it's just because they, they had this perception of the world as it was at that moment. And I think the other aspect, which is really, to me, poignant in a way, is why on earth, if I may say so, why on earth are scientists who are, you know, well recognized in their own time, why do they look back and why do they want to rehabilitate and reassign and make sense of <coughs> their, their predecessors? Of course, you can say, okay, it's a way of, you know, taking away from someone else. But I think beyond that, there is a way of a kind of, um, in the same way element 43 seems to exist from the dawn of time until last judgment, the community exist from the dawn of time to the last judgment, and there must be a consensus on what has been produced. I think this is really, that's how I see it. It's not very philosophical, but it's a, <laughs> it's a very, I think it grounds the scientific committee. And again, this is a conversation that you can start with the scientists saying, why does it matter to you? But, but if I can rephrase the question, once they had the periodic table, once a few of those elements, the gaps in the periodic table had been discovered as elements, have there been chemists who questioned this whole methodology and said, why should all the gaps in the periodic table have to be filled? I, 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 I don't think I ever encountered anyone who question that, well, maybe there just is a big jump in atomic weight and, and there will always be a gap here. It seems, and I think that's what you were asking. It seems that if there's a gap, it needs filling. Something needs to go there. Well, that's, that, that's, that's, yeah, that's true after um, Mosley. Sure, but before that, that is true. Yeah, then you can understand. Mosley, because yeah. Mosley was able to uh, find a law uh, that links the atomic number and the, um, X-ray spectra. And before that, the periodic table is built on the atomic weight. And atomic weights are not atoms at one weight. I mean, this I want to make sure that everyone knows. Atomic weights is, is, um, is a way to measure the proportion of matter that enters into reaction with another uh, piece of matter of reference. It could be uh, oxygen or, or, or hydrogen. So before, before mass spectrography, this is what atomic weights are. And, and of course, when the atomic weights were still, you know, moving around, you could you could have that argument. But once you have this law that links 
atomic number and X-ray spectra, there are obvious gaps in the periodic table. And uh, Moseley is in 1913. Um, and so by 25, everyone knows which are the gaps. And that's why after th uh, 1913, after Moseley, that's why I talk about element 43 and so on, because you know they each have a number. They're just waiting to be hunted and discovered. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And that's why the whole naming thing, you know, becomes more of a social thing or a, or a, or a professional feat or, you know, than, than really like Columbus or others before, maybe just setting sail in the total unknown and just looking, uh, I'm going to look at, for instance, the rare earth and I'm going to isolate and, and then what I isolate ends up to be two or three elements and, and that's the way it's constructed before. So is it correct to say that it's uh, a law of physics or a law of chemistry, uh, the one you were referring to, mostly law, that, mm, that uh, made what was produced purely mathematical possibilities into real physical uh, things that, that were waiting to be discovered? The there is a, there is a, yeah, there is a, um, a contribution by a guy, I think it's an Israeli, Gilad, Gilad, does that say He, he uh, talks about uh, Eka elements as possibilities. Mm. I can send you that if, if that's what you're interested in. The, the argument of the building of the mentality of people became very robust after Mosley Law, yes. but it was still used before. So it's not just the Mosley Law. So you, Mosley you Law, found it? Yeah. yeah. Not just the Mosley Law. That, that's, that's the argument how, how it's built with the symmetry of the thing and all that. That, that was the piece that was convincing for people that they say, oh, there's a thing there. Maybe we should look up to that. So it's a symmetry argument. I would like a very naive historical question. Uh, before the quantum theory of the atom, what was the definition of an element? Because in the 19th century, people were even doubting the existence of atoms. And so I suddenly asked the question, what what was for them an element? Yeah, that's that's where the atomic weight comes in into play. Only an atomic weight. No, no, not only. No, no, because it was it was also all kinds of properties. Um, so in 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 some early tables of Mendeleev, but maybe I should leave Peter because he's the he's the <laughs> he's the expert here. But in the in, in some early versions, um, it's also the kind of oxides that are formed. The, uh, how it binds with hydrogen. Um, similarity, I mean, the, the way it's organized, similarity in, in uh, chemical behavior. Um, spectroscopy. Yeah, spectroscopy. I mean, there was already visible spectroscopy, but it was kind of really, yeah. I mean, you, I can't, I, I just marvel at what they were able to do with those tools. I mean, when we are making comments on whatever they did right or wrong, and I hate to write or wrong, but there's a lot of history written that way. I just, I just can't believe they actually found anything. <laughs> it's just such a mess. Mm -hmm. But so back to the elements. So the, the in, in the, for instance, in um, when Mendeleev he defines the element, he says, you know, it's an entity that is. Uh, um, how do you say, Un, um, untransmutable? Um, Transmutable. Uh, yeah, um, okay. It's a basic source. Of yes, it's. Uh, yes. Preserved. Through, through a process, but that is uh, that has an individuality through uh, properties like, um, uh, what do you say, that uh, uh, burning, boiling points, and, and all these things, plus chemical properties. And and uh, what what else? <laughs> well, I think I think that's it, yeah. yeah. But Mendeleev feels that 
these elements survive chemical change, but throughout during this chemical change, a lot of those properties may disappear. So the fact that it is reactive or, or has a certain color, but the one thing that remains constant according to the is the atomic weight, and that's why he puts so much emphasis on the atomic weight as, as you know maybe the most defining property of the element. Did Mendeleev believe in atoms? <laughs> that was quite early. What do you I, say? I, I would be tempted to say he, he um, I don't think he was very interested in the question. I think to him the individuality of the elements mm -hmm. was much more important. Mm -hmm. But I do think that when the individuality of the elements was called into question, he was ready to go uh, towards a more atomic or complex picture of the elements. And I think he did, especially early on in his career, especially with the rare earths, where he, he felt me be forced to postulate that maybe the elements have a complex character. Uh, but all of that was just instrumental to, to safeguard the individuality of them. But you know, you're the book, you know, more history of chemistry, but I, I remember a, a conference in the 19th century where the French and the German chemists discussed the existence of atom in, in the second part of the 19th century. And they clearly do not want to say they are a no, so the discussion, I think you're referring to the Karlsruhe Conference, 1860, yeah, called by Kekulé and, and others. So they were not discussing about atoms. They don't want to go there. They want to no, go that's, discrete, discrete stuff, mm -hmm. but not atoms. So the, so the well, the, um, they, they were convened to discuss, and this goes back to the question you asked, uh, about terminology, because they were uh, using different uh, terminology, even chemical formulas, depending on which atomic weight uh, scale they were using. So on top of the material, practical mess, there was this mental mess. And in, in 1860, Kekulé decided, okay, this is, this is uh, we need to, to agree on how we name uh, and which formula we give to the to the substances. During that very um, three days, I think, discussion, and it was like a, a, a diplomatic conference because there were representatives from all, all parts of the uh, Western world. Um, Canizaro distributed his uh, essay on uh, Avogadro hypothesis mm -hmm. and the distinction between atoms and molecules, which was one of the way to set everyone uh, on, on, I mean, to make everyone agree, because one of the problem with the atomic weight is, and that goes back to the, what is an element? Um, it is, are you talking about the molecule of hydrogen or the element hydrogen. And of course, depending on that, you have H2 or H, and then for all the, the other. And so he, he there was a, a consensus, a practical consensus on agreeing using that, but there was no consensus um, on the, the yeah, yeah, the, 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 I mean, they were left each other with their own uh, uh, beliefs. Uh, but again, what I really admire is the fact that they are able to sh have a pluralistic spectrum of beliefs, but they are able to share the information because, because they accepted that. I mean, though you looked, when you saw the Ogawa um, claim, he says 50, hence uh, 100, they are still working with different scales. Yes. For the atomic weight of eka manganese he thought had seen but so again it's really practical it's really mm -hmm. constructed but we have a we have a similar history about the uh, nomenclature and electricity right. because the british were using coil as a standard and the other was using charge and there's a meeting and they decide to do a mix of the two which is completely more impractical impractical but at least everybody had the same and everybody contributed equally and everybody went went after happy <laughs> and it's why we use the, the standard today but but that was a 
they mixed two things that should not be mixed. Mm -hmm. But I remember, yeah, that this conference, so they, they say we will adopt something to have discrete, discreteness, but we don't status about where this discreteness comes from. And it's not surprising in the middle of 19th century, this positivist, you know, let's be careful about where people in 17th century, some were deep atomist and other, no way. And 19th century, more careful, yeah. Usually, yeah. But, but most chemists, if not all, are, are um, corp corpus colorists. Mm -hmm. So you, you can you can believe in in molecules and not in atoms. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that chemists, all chemists, believe in molecules. Mm -hmm. hmm? yeah, not nowadays, not in the past. Well, I, I thought in the nineteenth century yeah, there is, a, yeah. But then, why was there this sort of discussion about? Atoms existing or not existing, continuous matter or discrete matter. But that was not the question because the, the discrete matter is something. I mean, even in the 17th century, um, alchemists um, knew that you know there was a, a proportion at minima. The fact the fact that reaction occurs in certain proportion. Yeah, okay. It's discreteness uh, in, in, in the reaction. Exactly. Like now, yes, yes. An atomic weight is, is actually an expression of that. I mean, some, some disguise atomic weights and calling them equivalents, but ça revient un peu au même. Yes. In, in the practice. So discreteness is not, is not the, the real problem. But then well, what you say about elements and atoms, you know, this is something that in science teaching this is something that nobody everyone overlooks but when in the classroom you show those elements and then you do you perform an experiment let's say displacement of copper and so on so are you talking about the element or the atom and when you write down the reaction you say something and I think again, this this explains why for 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 teachers and and, and the classroom, it's not easy. And this is where philosophy and history of science can help, in my opinion. Yeah. So. Time for a break. No, we are. <laughs> 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 yeah. Thank you.